The Secrets of Middle-Earth is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Middle-Earth, where we discuss the hidden themes and deeper layers found in the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, whether in his writings or in any of the media derived from them. I'm Thomas Salerno, and joining me today are Caitlin Fasisa. Hello, Caitlin. Hi, how's it going? Good. And Jeff Hecker. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Thomas. And Thomas Sanherho. Hello, Thomas. Hey, Thomas. <laughs> and be sure to follow The Secrets of Middle Earth in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or any podcast directory or app. And find us on social media at facebook.com slash starquestmedia. Or on Twitter, where we are at SQPN, or on Instagram, where we are at StarQuest Network. Please, please be sure to share the secrets of Middle Earth with your family and friends, or anyone who you think will enjoy listening to these discussions. There's a lot of Middle Earth content out there on the web, but this show aims to explore the legendarium from a specifically Catholic perspective. And we even recorded an entire episode recently on how Catholicism influenced Tolkien's life and work. But before we get into tonight's topic, um, I just wanted to discuss a few bits of Rings of Power news. I know, Jeff, that you saw that there was a rumor that Tom Bombadil himself, Jolly Tom, might be appearing in season two, which would be pretty crazy. Hey, doll, Mary doll. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was just wondering, like, I don't even know if they have the rights to that character. Well, he's in the Lord of the Rings, and they have the Lord of the Rings. That's true, yeah. Seems fair game mm -hmm. to me. Mm. I don't know what he would be doing, though. Like, Well, I could see the, um, the Harfoots, the Harfoots yeah. running into him. Yeah, sure. I would hope, yeah. if anything, it's like uh, kind of like how it is in the Lord of the Rings, where he kind of just bursts onto the scene randomly, <laughs> he has this moment, and then he's gone, and you never see him again. Like, I would, I would really enjoy that. Like, he rescues no them or something. No explanation. <laughs> yeah, no explanation, and then he's just gone, and we never see him again. Yeah, I know. Basically, like an an extended cameo, or like right. he's there for one episode. They're like, you know what? We we needed a filler episode for this season. Like we have a slot <laughs> where we haven't scheduled anything. Let's just put Tom in there. It'd be great. <laughs> oh my gosh. I don't know, with as much as they tried to cram into last season, I hope they don't try for fillers. In the right, no, I yeah, exactly. Say, I think yeah. I would have uh, some choice words for them. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need any fillers. Yeah, like what? Only like if if they do what they did last season, it'll be only like eight or ten episodes. And it's yeah, like, I think it's supposed to be eight, eight per eight. season. Which is not nearly enough. <laughs> yeah, but not, not a whole lot of room filler. for distractions. Right, right. yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I think they've actually started casting new characters as as if the cast of this show wasn't enormous enough <laughs> right. need more characters they gotta be right they gotta keep us on our toes see that's the thing is because we've already predicted who a bunch of people are going to be and they right. need to at the very least throw us off <laughs> for the next couple of seasons <laughs> yeah i i think i saw that like they cast a new elf character at least that's what the reports i saw indicated yeah um, and he looks like a younger guy. Is it that guy? Um, I actually saw like a female elf, maybe. Oh, OK. I saw there was well. a rumor about a like a young man. And I think his name was like Cal Way or something like that. Oh, OK. That's um, interesting. Um, but yeah, they, they were also talking about a, a female elf. So I don't know. It's it's hard to follow the rumors because they're kind of all all over the place. And you don't really right, know what's yeah. true yet. But it is fun. Yeah, I think they've also there's speculation they're they're casting Kurt on the shipwright as well. Um, I think we may have discussed that before. So I don't right. think anything's been confirmed. But if you see an an older gentleman with a beard, then there's a chance that could be our <laughs> could be Kurt Ann <laughs> showing up. I think he he may be one of the that may be one of those announcements they'll save till like closer to the when the actual when they start promoting like and doing right. trailers and stuff like that i wonder if they're going to give us another set of posters again like they did with season one if we'll get like oh, we yeah. had hands in this one if we'll get like i don't know so, like their faces or something or like side profiles their feet. Their, yeah, i don't, I don't, <laughs> so, I don't know yeah. about that one. 
<laughs> so, so, so they can do all new book covers and make even yeah. more money. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, because those first ones were so great. <laughs> Uh, I, I look. I, I'm looking forward to what they're doing with it. I think their, um, yeah. I think their advertising has been pretty good. If if nothing yeah. else, they have done a really good job of making sure that the the show gets promoted well and building hype. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're kind of drip feeding us little bits of behind the scenes and little tiny amounts of content to keep us going. But uh, un- until until uh, we get some more substantial Rings of Power news uh, t- in today's discussion in. Celebration of St. Valentine's Day, we are going to be talking about the great love stories of Tolkien's Legendarium, because there are quite a few of them, and they're all really fascinating. And uh, the, the first question I want to throw out there to you guys before we, before we start talking about individual stories is, what is your favorite romance in the Legendarium and why? All right, I'm, go- I'm going to say it, uh, Gimli and Galadriel. <laughs> ah. I'm just gonna throw it out That's there. That's great. <laughs> I was not expecting that one. <laughs> I, I actually really love that relationship because it's it's an adoration more than it is like you know a romance, and right. it's so cool because it really is like completely from left field. Now it's it's obviously not my favorite romance from. <laughs> <laughs> from the Lord of the Rings because Galadriel's taken, darn it, and that's, that's something that needs to be said and repeated often. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, th- I think that one's great and uh, is totally worth mentioning uh, coming into this conversation. Yeah, I like how um, I, I like how just how when when Galadriel uses uh, those names, those words in the dwarf tongue, it kind of softens Gimli a little bit. Mm-hmm. You know, and af- af- after Celeborn had just insulted him, saying, you know, if, <laughs> right. if I had known what you guys had done, I would never have let you in here just because of Gimli, you know? <laughs> right. He's not very friendly. <laughs> well, and that's the animosity that the, you know, the elves and the dwarves have at this point, at that point in the, the, in the history. They have that animosity. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's just interesting that it's overcome by Galadriel's, uh, her peace and her ability to kind of just speak into a person very completely and her gift too, the way that she gifts three of her her hairs to Gimli mm-hmm. um right. and that's one of those things that after you have read the Silmarillion or, or I forget where it is exactly but once you've read a lot more Tolkien and you know about how Feanor had asked Galadriel for her hair and she had refused him that just adds so much more weight to it and it's such a big deal that she yes, would, yeah. would do that. And it's uh, it's the beginning of the healing between the dwarves and the elves in a way. Yeah. And not to spin off too much into the Rings of Power fan fiction, but I was almost thinking along the way as we were, I was kind of looking up stuff for this episode that I wonder if we might see Galadriel kind of become friends with any dwarves this season because or the in the next season or two, because I don't oh, yeah. think we've seen her interact with an, a dwarf in the show so far. So I wonder if we kind of maybe see. You know, maybe she and she meets Durin or or something like that, because, you know, she's in uh, a region now or, or that's kind of where she ended up. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, maybe we'll see her kind of starting to be friend of dwarf because she's she's friends with Elrond. So and Elrond's you know best friend right now is a dwarf. So, um, you know, maybe we'll kind of see the kind of glimmerings of that. You know, obviously it's different than the, you know, the the, the written uh, legendarian, but maybe we'll see something there. Yeah, that would be fun. And Jeff, do you do, do you have a favorite love story in the canon? I didn't. I hadn't uh, thought this out, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I um, sprung it on you guys. Yeah. Uh, no, you're, it's all good. I mean, I don't know. It's hard. I, I think Baron and Luthien might be mm. the might be my favorite. I'm tempted to say Aragorn and Arwen, just because I'm like Aragorn's my guy. Um, but we just don't see. It, we see we know more from the books of their kind of relationship but she's it's really not too much in there so just going off of i guess the amount of text there is i i think baron and luthien is their i mean their whole relationship is is just it's really interesting and really cool like they she has a talking dog that they go on an adventure with and they Uh she goes you know he because he and, you know, for those who may not have read the Silmarillion, he has, as we'll you know discuss, he falls in love with her and tries tells her father, you know, I want I'm in love with her, and he says, well, you'll have to do something impossible, like 
give me a Silmaril. And he's like, okay. And then she goes with him to do it because she's, you know, reciprocates those feelings. So, and just their whole adventure and, and what it all leads to is just um, really cool. So I think, I think it's probably my favorite of, of the Legendarium. Um, I've heard it said that Baron and Luthien go through more than anybody else in the canon to be together. Yeah, I think that's accurate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't think of anyone else. This is something I'm sure we'll touch on as we go through it, but it's really interesting because in much of fantasy writing, the romances are the things that drive the story, that drive the quests. And interestingly, in Tolkien's, that's not the case. Like everything is is world powers. It's very pushing because evil must be overcome. There is a sense of justice that must be righted. Uh, There's a weight of doing things. That's not because you're out to save the princess or uh, reattach to your romance. Like it, like the Arwen Aragorn thing is very, uh, it's, it's so tangential to the story that you could even leave it out and still end up with much of the same tale. And that's, I mean, it's appendixed essentially in the, in the original <laughs> tale. Yeah. So, but Baron and Luthien is not like that. Like that's the one tale where there's a lot of work that they went through to be together and it's different from the other romances in that way yeah definitely yeah, that's, that's probably what i like about it what about you caitlin do you have a favorite yeah i think mine would have to be aon and faramir um i yeah. just i love first of all i love the way that it really just comes out of nowhere when you're reading and and mm-hmm. suddenly tolkien is writing like the most fluffy romance and they're like kissing up in the view of everyone and <laughs> they don't care if anyone sees you know like yeah um but i love the way that their relationship is a source of healing for each other and they meet in mm. the houses of healing and when they meet aowen is just like all she wants to do is just go die in battle because she had really seen herself as needing to become a queen in order to like secure the safety or the glory or the life that she felt she needed. And when Aragorn was kind of like, sorry, I don't like you like that. um, She just was so hopeless. And, and then for Faramir, like how much he's gone through with his, his brother dying and his dad just being awful and, you know, everything he's gone through. So then when they come together, it's like, they're growing on their own as they're growing together. And I just think that's really sweet. And I love the way Tolkien mm. wrote it. Yeah. I, I, th- I think for mine, I, I definitely have to agree with you, Caitlin. It's, it's Faramir and Eowyn and I'm not sure exactly why. I mean, like part of it is probably because I just really like Faramir. Yeah. He's, he's like, like the ideal person. Yeah. He's, he's like that kind of the, the archetype of like the chivalrous Arthurian knight. He, he's almost like mm-hmm. Percival out of like Knights of the Round Table or something. And Gowan. Yeah. That, yeah, exactly. That yeah. Purely honorable uh, knight. Yeah. Purely honorable. And like him, him and Eowyn are, are, are so compatible, even though they have very different personalities. And it's, it's just an interesting romance in the story because it, it kind of, like you said, Caitlin, it kind of comes out of nowhere, but it, it it's kind of almost like, that tale is like a respite for the reader from everything mm-hmm. else that's going on. Cause like, mm-hmm. I remember at the same time, like Frodo and Sam are just like trudging their way to the mountain. Like they're almost there. And meanwhile, Aragorn and everybody else have gone to like fight the hosts of Mordor at the black gate. And there's all this huge world ending stuff going on. And then Tolkien's like, I'm just going to take some time to tell <laughs> this nice little romance to help you guys in decompress. A yeah. <laughs> on a bench. <laughs> just there <laughs> just there like before this like insane battle takes place i i have to say that one's my favorite too and i the the thing that i really love about it is like you said thomas that the two characters are so different mm. and the interesting thing is is like i can see them settling down afterwards so i could write yeah. entire novels about the rest of their life you know where <laughs> yeah exactly there's like the you know the calm collected king and Eowyn's like we have to do something about this <laughs> and it's like okay let's figure this out you know it's just I, I you can really the romance just speaks into the rest of their life and that's what's so neat about those two characters 
Yeah, definitely. And when, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll talk more about them as we go through, but I think we would be remiss if we didn't start our kind of like, you know, in-depth discussion of these tales without starting with Baron and Luthien, because that's the one that Tolkien kind of viewed as an allegory for his relationship with Edith. I mean, it, it's on their headstones, right? You mm-hmm. know, Baron and Luthien and, I just love it. It's my favorite part of the Silmarillion. Like, I, I just love it. I think it's such an awe because it's like uh, in, in, in so many other fantasies, it's the knight goes out to save the princess. You know, the, the classic like Legend of Zelda kind of mm-hmm. trope, which is great. <laughs> but like Luthien actually does a lot of really cool stuff, <laughs> which is yeah. awesome. They're they're a partnership. That's so cool. It is so cool when you think about that in terms of him feeling so inspired by his own romance with his wife, like that he viewed her as someone so capable and like able to help him and not just mm. like, oh, she's a damsel in distress. Like she's she's competent and she's brave and courageous and like she can get things done and they are so good together. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, I think the really the really interesting thing about her is that she's she's a bizarrely strong feminist character right like it's she she does things herself she has a motivation for herself and it and because of that she's more attractive as a as you know someone to love someone that this other person who's who's obviously very powerful on in his own right uh would love not that she needs saving and that he's always going to have to be you know picking up after her and then he's going to put her in his castle and she's just going to sit there. Right. But that they're going to go on adventures together and they're going to do things that change the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's just even more powerful when she's, I mean, she's the daughter of a, of an angel, basically an an angel Mm -hmm. and an elf. So she's, um, she, she has, she's called, I think the fairest of the children of Iluvatar or something along those lines. Um, and you know, she found her, she couldn't find, you know, anyone among her own kind uh, that were that she, you know, felt matched with or and it wasn't until this guy, this bearded wooded guy in the woods found her because uh, <laughs> I believe they met. He, she was dancing in the woods while Baron was kind of on the run from uh, the forces of, uh, of uh, Morgoth. Right. And that's kind of kicked the whole thing off. And like I said, he mm-hmm. he wanted, you know, he he fell for her. And so he told her, you know, high king elvish father married to an angel saying, you know, what can I do to <laughs> prove my worth? And he says, oh, I don't know. Go steal this thing from the devil. And she's like, he goes and she's like, I'm going with you. And yeah, as we said, they're just their their whole definitely if you haven't read for our listeners, if you haven't read their part of the similar similar really in their tale, it's it's, you know, one of the best because I think it's almost it's also kind of may be some of the oldest of his uh of some of Tolkien's mm-hmm. writings just because it was so foundational from his own life. Um, and I think from what, just to touch on Tolkien and his wife for a minute, I, from what I remember, I wrote a book report back in high school or middle school where it was uh, while he was writing the, the legendarium, his wife would kind of like play piano for him or just kind of like hang out with him. So it was kind of like he, you know, she was providing this backdrop for him to create this world. Um, cause he was, I think at that point had been, you know, he'd been in world war one and, uh, you know, lost most of his friends. So he definitely had some, you know, probably had what we would call today post-traumatic, uh, stress from that. And just from the loss he had suffered from his mother and his, so she kind of provided that like, you know, safety, uh, net for him. So, if, mm-hmm. um, I need to see if I can dig up that report because it, it might be. Yeah. Garage, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. But, uh, I don't have I, any I, of my book reports from that period. <laughs> They're all gone. Yeah. yeah, it was it was it was on a, one of a biography of his. So. Um, oh, nice. But yeah, I, I still remember that because, like I said, that kind of kicked off my Tolkien. You know, back when the movies came were coming out, I kind of kicked off my like Tolkien fandom. So right. I still remember, you know, some from that report. But yeah, I mean, it's it's just their story is just so powerful, and then. So I have to I have to ask the question of you guys, like, where do you remember? F- where's your strongest first memory of this relationship? Because I have a very specific like spot in Lord of the Rings that I remember first hearing about Baron and Luthien and like being like, oh, who are these guys? And then, oh, yeah, you know, 
as it kind of builds, you, you learn more and more about them, and then you get the Silmarillion, and you, you start really digging into who they are. So right, I'm intrigued. Like <laughs> I feel like really, it almost feels like everything in the Silmarillion is building up to Baron and Luthien, and then that's like the mm -hmm. core of the story. And then afterwards, everything is kind of the falling action, in my opinion. So it's like it really is at the heart of the Silmarillion, and. Mm -hmm knowing how much it meant to him personally, I think that makes it even cooler. Yeah. Like I remember, like, I guess the first time I would ever have heard of them was when Aragorn chants that song to the hobbits mm -hmm. in fellowship mm -hmm. of the ring when they're a weather top and you're right. like, and it, it's so cool because like middle earth is one of those worlds where it's not just a story. There are stories within the story mm -hmm. and Baron and Luthien is one of them in the Lord of the Rings. Like he mentions them, but he doesn't tell you their whole story, which is why, like, I always tell people, if if you read the Silmarillion after reading Lord of the Rings, go back and reread Lord of the Rings again. Right. Because then you're going to see all those references and be like, oh, geez, like, you know, that's who they were talking about. And you totally understand why it was yes. relevant at mm -hmm. that particular moment or why mm -hmm. it was encouraging or why it was, you know, the thing that was going to get you through, you know, so... Yeah, I, that that's the one I I remember specifically that one, and that's and and you do you at that point you question like who are these? I mean, I guess this must be like somebody he knows or something. And then as you kind of dive deeper into them encountering the elves and uh, getting to know more about what they're what they're really doing, it's uh, it's it's deep because it it's so all encompassing, and you find that Aragorn really loves those legends and he's modeling himself after these uh these people that have gone oh, before yeah. him mm -hmm. and plus like B baron and luthien is probably it, it that story has probably my favorite moment in the whole legendarium which is when luthien destroys the fortress of sauron with her song magic <laughs> i i don't know mm -hmm. what it is about that but that's amazing and I, it's just, just just such a cool moment like she really is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love how she, I forget the details exactly. It's been a while since I read it, but the way that she basically gets Sauron to yield to her, like she's like, you have to yield or else I'm going to, you know, you're going to have to go back to Morgoth and, and face him. And you can tell he's so scared of Morgoth that he's like, okay. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like, yeah, I think she says like, otherwise I, if, if you don't, like, give me power over this island. I'll just let Huon here destroy your physical right. form. And then he'll have to basically return to Sauron as just like a, I mean, to Morgoth as just like a spirit. Yeah. And that would be humiliating. So he's like, all right. And then, like, of course, like the, the, the fact that, you know, they, they, they meet each other in the halls of Mandos and they get sent back. You know, she pleads with Mandos to to let them be together. You know, after everything that ha has happened, you know, because Baron, of course, ends up, you know, s spoilers for those who haven't read the Silmarillion, but, you know, <laughs> Baron, yeah. and he, he, he doesn't so much die in the quest to get the Silmaril for Luthien. It's more like in the aftermath of that mm -hmm. with the 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 wolf Karkaroth and there's all that mess and Baron ends up kind of dying and then. Luthien dies of grief, which is awful. And then but they're 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 given this kind of second life where she can die as as a mortal woman. And then it says like they they both it says something interesting. They they both left beyond the circles of the world, but that no one knows where their graves are. Mm -hmm. Which I thought mm -hmm. was interesting. Almost like they were assumed right into the afterlife like 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 some of the biblical figures like Elijah or the Blessed Mother, you know, where they're assumed body and soul into the afterlife instead of leaving a grave that we can find. So that's a, that, that was an interesting wrinkle to end the and story I, on that way. And in the middle of the story, I just remember there was a scene where they were they were on their quest and they killed like a bat creature. And she like I, I'd have to reread it, but it's, it's camera. She like took the wings of the bat and flew around or something like that. Or she like. She like disguises took, herself yeah. as the bat somehow. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just That's like also so cool. Yeah. It's such a it, it, like I said, just definitely read it. Um if yes. for if you haven't, because it's it's some of the because like I said, we've said it's kind of based on his his own relationship. So it's kind of 
he poured probably most of his soul into that one as compared to anything. So. Yeah. And like, and speaking of Aragorn and Arwen, because they're kind of the echo of this relationship in the Lord of the Rings. And there's actually an interesting debate. I remember watching a YouTube video where they had essentially made the case that the tale of Aragorn and Arwen isn't enough of an echo of Baron and Luthien, that mm. Arwen should have had more agency in the Lord of the Rings and done more. I think the specific idea was like, oh, she she should have gone with the Grey Company to meet Aragorn. Mm. And I don't know how you guys feel about that. Do, do you think that it's 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 perfect the way it is or that Arwen, you know, should have had more of a presence in the Lord of the Rings than she does? I kind of think of the way that Elrond has already lost so many people in his life that I can imagine as a protective father, he probably really, really, really wouldn't have wanted her to do that because he's already yeah. lost his parents, his brother and his wife. And so even though he is going to lose Arwen in the end, because she's going to stay in middle earth, I, I can just, I can see that as a, a reason why she wouldn't have participated as much, just kind of spending as much time as she could with him and, and him wanting to keep her safe. Yeah. And they, I mean, they, they added more to the films and they changed some things. Uh, obviously Arwen is in the, in the books is not the one who, takes Frodo from uh, Weathertop to Rivendell and, and all that. That's no, it's uh, Glorfindel. Right. But so I, so, and I think that was just kind of a modern, we need to give her, you know, if she's going to be, you know, kind of the culmination of things, their wedding, then you know, she needs to have a bigger part. And there were, there are other parts sprinkled throughout the movies where she's, you know, she's, Elrond wants her to go to the, go to the West and, you know, he's like, do you have my love daughter? And he says, she says, I, yes, father, you have it. And she decides to go. But, um, so I think, you know, there's, I, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say Tolkien didn't write it the right way. Cause right. <laughs> <you> know, <Yeah. laughs> who, who, am I to, who am I to say that? But I think, you know, if, if, if I was writing it, I, you know, even if I don't give her the same things that the films did, I might have her in there more, um, just so that, you know, as readers, we kind of can, so you can kind of see her and get to know her because she's a she's an interesting character. And I did like her her that moment where she's introduced in the movie where she sneaks up on Aragorn. Yeah. And mm -hmm. What's this? A ranger caught off his guard. I just like that moment. <laughs> the, the look he gives her is like, uh, you know, like, <laughs> of, of course you would sneak up on me. Right. That part is so funny to me because like like I didn't get to read the books before I saw the movies because I was a little I was young and I didn't even know about the books, but can you imagine like being someone who had read the books and you were so excited to see Glorfindel and then the light shines and then it's Arwen and you like, I just like, yes, I would be, I can imagine that because that was me. Like, <laughs> that's one of those and moments Glorfindel's where he, one of my favorites. Yeah. So that was like, was great. stomping what? out of the movie theater. Like, what is this? Who is like, this? <laughs> Yeah, I, I had I had that ex had that exact experience because so um, yeah I, uh, I and and that's what I was waiting for because he he appears like earlier in the books too so there's 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 another spot where he's kind of kind of makes an appearance and it didn't happen in the movie so I was waiting for that moment I was like okay surely this is you know this is coming and I was like yeah okay so bad. Um, yeah and so I'm I'm not as I wasn't as infuriated as as a lot of people were <laughs> but it, it was it was one of those moments where I'm like. Okay, I I guess we're going this direction with it. Yeah. All right, uh, I will try and accept this. But um, yeah, and and it's it, it's really one of those things because even in reading the books, I, again, she's sort of an appendix to piece. You know, she's like right. uh, she's mentioned outside of the main tale itself, uh, for the most part. I mean, there there are small mentions inside of the tale, and you do have to you do have to negotiate that. As, and it's especially useful in the relationship that Aragorn has with the elves as a whole, because it's really important to that relationship and to what that ends up becoming for the humans when he becomes the High King again, when he returns to that status. Right. And that that bit in the appendix, the, the tale of Aragorn and Arwen, is probably one of my favorite parts of the Lord of the Rings that's not in the main story. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I love that. That's great. And, and that that 
that ending where he passes, you know, and, and she's calling him by the name he went by as a child, Estelle. That that always chokes me up. No matter mm-hmm. how many times I've read it or listened to the audiobook, I always get misty eyed at that part. I'm such a sucker. <laughs> but like, it's just so great. Which which I think this is a good time to mention. If you are a person who is a Lord of the Rings fan and has read the books, but has not dug through the appendices, do it. Right. <laughs> because it is there's so much there that gives breadth to the world and and depth to the characters that you really you want to have because it it just enriches everything that is the the tale itself and it's funny because in we all know as lord of the ring fans that there's supposed to be three great unions of the eldar and the dunedain right there's baron and luthien aragorn and arwen and the one that everyone forgets about tuor and idril because they they don't have as well, I I think they're mentioned like briefly in in the Silmarillion because I, he never finished that. I don't think T- Tolkien he had never the fall of Gondolin was something he had been working on since he was in the trenches of World War One, but that he had never fully completed all the way through. And I, I know mm-hmm. they were able to cobble together the book that's called The Fall of Gondolin from his various mm-hmm. notes and stuff, but it's like it we don't have a sort of complete coherent story all the way through of Tuor and Idril's relationship. But it's huge because it get, they their child is a Arundel. Mm-hmm. Right. Like she's him, like a big deal. Yeah. Without him, you know, we, we, we don't have Elrond and Elros. We don't have the Dunedain. We don't have any of that stuff. Right. So, yeah, like although I, I like their relationship because I, I like Tuor. I like that he, you know, I just think he's an interesting character. He's very driven and he's obviously very protective of his family, given what we see him do in The Fall of Gondolin. It, it's just mm-hmm. an, an overlooked story. I, I feel like I feel like it's because we don't get enough about Idril. Yeah. In the story, like like Tour just kind of dominates the tale and which is very fitting for his character, but uh, <laughs> but it's not necessarily great for like, you know, for a romance. <laughs> right. right. I think that's why Baron and Luthien and and Arwen and Aragorn and uh, Eowyn and Faramir really stand out because you get to know both characters so well. And with Tuor and Idril, it's like, well, we know Tuor, but not too much about Idril. Yeah, we, we know more about her father, Tuor, than we mm-hmm. do about her. Like, I can't even remember who... Idril's mother was and now I'm like oh yeah no I can't even remember see it's like <laughs> Tolkien you you should have given us more details about that I'm sure it's buried in there somewhere I just can't remember I'm sure it's I on only Tolkien know because Gateway. I just looked up a, yeah, <laughs> yeah I just looked up a, a, a family tree so oh it's okay Elway. perfect <laughs> although if, if I remember correctly Idril is actually one of the people who kind of see not sees it coming but suspects that there might that Morgoth might eventually take over Gondolin because that, that was Tuor's original mission was to go mm-hmm. to Gondolin on behalf of Olmo and warn them that Morgoth is coming. And if I remember correctly, Idril is actually the one who helped spearhead the whole sort of underground tunnels that were, you know, that the elves could escape through. Right. The and they're like, sacked. and they're kept secret so that they aren't compromised. Right. And yeah. It's through the tunnels that they escape. And there's just that great moment when that, that rat Maglin tries to ki- to kidnap Idril and kill Arondil, and he and Tuor throws him off the precipice of the city. It's like like everything in the Silmarillion, it's really over the top. They say his body hits the mountainside three times before falling into the fire, and I'm like, geez, I'm like, okay. Well, if if he's it's that. It's fun in a way because that's the same way that his father died being right. cast from the walls. And as his father was about to be cast from the walls, he, he cursed him and he was like, may you die the same death as me. And, and then it happened. So that's, yeah, we, that's another one. I love the way that Tolkien weaves everything together like that mm-hmm. because you forget about it. And then once it yes. happens, you, you remember, you're like, Oh, he did say that would happen. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Well, and they're so long lived too, right? They're like, that's, oh, that's yeah. the thing is like, you have all these characters that just 
are alive for a very long time. And mm-hmm. so they do many, many things between being cursed by their father <laughs> and, and falling off the wall themselves. Right. And that's a whole other discussion that like in the realm of Arda, oaths and curses have actual power. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not just mm-hmm. words, you know, like you you take an oath or you curse somebody and that's going to have huge consequences later on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't want to mess around with that. And it, it's funny because I, I think a lot of the elves that we see involved in the great love stories are mostly Noldor, except maybe Luthien, right? Because, yeah, because Lu- Luthien is the daughter, daughter of Thingol and he's he's not Noldor. But I, I think Tolkien definitely favors the Noldor. That's why we get more yeah. stories about them. They were kind of like <laughs> like their Aule's favorite. I think they were Tolkien's favorite. Right. Yeah. And Aule is the great sub creator. Right. So he's so. almost <laughs> like an author insert. Right. For Tolkien. But of course, one of the greatest Noldor is Galadriel. And she does not fall in love with either a human or Sauron or anybody else or another Noldor. <laughs> but it's Celeborn, a Sindar. He, yes. he definitely marries up, you know? <laughs> uh-huh. it's like, yeah. And I, I, I just I just loved that moment in the Rings of Power where she she remembers calling him a silver clam. I just thought that was that to 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 use kind of a tortured expression, but it kind of humanizes Mm-hmm. her yeah. th- their relationship a little bit it makes it more approachable because yeah, in in the fellowship of the ring they're just these in in both the book and the movie they're just kind of these two luminous figures and they don't like you know you you don't get a sense of their relationship so i just like that moment in the rings of power i thought that was good i hope we'll get a nice reunion with them yeah yeah she calls him that and i i, I pulled together a few notes on them um but her name, the name he gives her, uh, in the, I believe it's the uh, Cinderin translation of Quenya, is the maiden crowned with a garland of bright radiance. So he gives her this fancy name, and she calls him a, a silver clam. <laughs> right. Well, that, oh, that's and she's th- like, yeah. she's like, I called him a silver clam, and I never saw him again. Like maybe because <laughs> you were kind of mean to him. <laughs> right. So I'm not right. Going like, back. Come on. I know. He's like went to the grocery store to get a gallon of milk and never came back. <laughs> But yeah, and in fact, I think Galadriel is that name, the the crowned with mm-hmm. radiance. So that's the name he gave her because elves, everybody in Arda has multiple names because Tolkien, Tolkien loves names. So elves have both a name that their father gives them and a name that their mother gives them. And sometimes also a name that their lover gives them. And that was that's Galadriel, that name is the name that Celeborn gives her, which I just think is so is that's great. And it's funny because everybody I think you mentioned this, Caitlin, in one of our previous episodes, but everybody falls in love with Galadriel, mm-hmm. <laughs> including a bunch of other elves. Like you, you mentioned Feanor, he wanted like, you know, a he lock of her, of her hair. hair. Yeah. But then Celebrimbor, too. I think it's mm-hmm. in the Unfinished Tales. He's like oh, you you went with Celeborn, but I really love you. And so he he made for her that that jewel that she eventually gives to Aragorn, right? The the Elisar, the elf stone. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's like everybody's falling in love with Galadriel. Yeah, well, I mean, and you see the hobbits fall in love with her. Gimli falls in love with her. It's just right. there's it's her her beauty is so intense and radiant. Um, she's just irresistible to everyone, I guess. Well, and in the in the show, they they said the way that she says she met him was actually pulled from Baron and Luthien. Like she, mm-hmm. cause I did something right. along the lines of they, he saw her or they met in a glade of flowers in the, in, in the starlight or something along that line. So yeah. they actually pulled from Baron and Luthien for that part of the show. So, um, which from according to what I was reading, it, it sounds like they met in, in Doriath where right. uh, Thingol was his king. As we mentioned, Thingol is Luthien's uh, father. So. I guess if Luthien is over there dancing in glades of flowers, there there are probably lots of glades of flowers. So it's not like that's impossible. But yeah, I, I don't really understand why they gave um, that to her story. But we don't have to talk too much about the Rings of Power. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I, I, I'm just like, well, I'll bet you a lot of elf couples meet that way. That just sounds like a very 
elf yeah. thing to That's do. That's the local bar. That's the sweet. girls are yeah. just all out. They each pick a glade of flowers. They're like, okay, and they and they talk to all their other elf girlfriends, and they're like, okay, make sure he walks by at this time. I'm gonna be there. <laughs> yeah. there, it <laughs> there it is. The romance. Ta -da. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting, though, it's it's not surprising that everyone falls in love with Galadriel because she knows that about herself when she's talking about what would happen if she took the ring, right? Mm -hmm. If she took the one yeah. ring, it would be, you know, that everyone would love her and despair. You know, that's that's such a uh, like a like she is very clear about what that power is that it's going to give her. And I think she probably knows the most out of anybody about what the rings do. Uh, and how they are sort of reflections of who's uh, using them. And I, I, this is something I, I would love to like, you know, dig into what the ring does at some point with right, you guys. Be yeah. Because, yeah. you know, like we only see the Hobbit wear it and the Hobbits, when they wear it, they go invisible and they, you know, and they, they and that's, that's like a power of the ring for the Hobbits, but that's kind of Hobbit nature. I would love to discuss what you think would happen if a human put it on or if an elf put it on and if it's specific to like the person that puts it on or if it's just so it's like a whole nother sidetrack. But I think she understands that. And that's why she says that if I were to take the ring, this is the power that it would give me. So she understands what it exactly would do. And it's essentially just amplify that gravitas that she has, that that impressiveness that she brings to such an extent that no one would be able to resist her and they would do whatever she said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're definitely right because I think she even tells Frodo that the ring gives power according to the measure of the possessor. Mm -hmm. So her having it is going to be way different than a hobbit having it and yeah. using it. Which is also why Gandalf was afraid to take it. He, he knew mm -hmm. how horrible he could be with it. And I don't I don't get what is with like these movie and television producers who are always trying to put Galadriel with other people, because then you in to you, you have in the <laughs> Hobbit movies. They have this weird kind of quasi yeah. romance between her and Gandalf. It was so I know. <laughs> dumb. I hated that. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I feel I'd... like the Hobbit movies were just like they were just flying by the seat of their pants. <laughs> and it almost feels like it was just a joke to them. Like. <laughs> Not yeah. to be rude, but no, yeah. Like when you watch it, it's just kind of like I'm dumbfounded. Like I, <laughs> like why would you do that with Gil like why would you hint at some kind of romance between Gandalf and Galadriel? Like that's insane. But I guess people like that. I don't know. Yeah, either that or it's just supposed to be that everybody in their own way, yeah, loves Galadriel. It's like. And it, it, and she she saw that effect that she has on people extends to Lothlorien because and mm -hmm. and people know about it because Boromir doesn't want to go in there at first because he says right. none who go in escape unscathed and Aragorn's like don't say unscathed say unchanged mm -hmm. right that everybody and, and he specifically it. means yeah he specifically means that they become enamored with her and right <laughs> can't escape it. And that's uh, it. It ties back into Aragorn and Arwen again because they are betrothed in Lothlorien because Arwen was staying there because she, Arwen is her Ar Galadriel is Arwen's grand uh, mother, yeah. grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, so and so, yeah, they, they have that wonderful like, you know, they I, I think it's at that it's not in the city itself. There's this kind of hilltop that they go to K Karen Amroth. That's it. And, you know, they, they in that moment in The Lord of the Rings, Frodo notices that Aragorn is kind of daydreaming and, and and talking to people whom he can't see. And he's remembering that moment of being betrothed to Arwen. And I'm like that. And which gets even more that it's an even greater moment if you've read the part in the appendix, just like you were right. saying. Thomas. <laughs> yeah, because it wasn't weren't Aragorn and Arwen in in Lorien for a while for like years together and mm -hmm. think before so. yeah. kind of he be, he left to kind of go on his you know taking up his role as uh chieftain of the dunedain and kind of starting his quest to become worthy of uh you know per elrond becoming worthy of uh marrying arwen so they were i mean they're 
they were there together for a while because he's long lived even uh, among men, not as long as elves. Mm-hmm. But Which, oh man, that's a whole that's a whole segment we could talk about too. Good grief! <laughs> like what <laughs> what it means what it means for someone to be worthy of uh, of a person. And I love I love that the way that Tolkien walks that line is so great because it, when. Aragorn is such a fantastic character for this too because it's like he never becomes worthy of being king he is always worthy of being king he's always established as the king he is the rightful king it's him recognizing that in himself that's the you know he has to fully embrace who he is for who he is not for the actions that he takes or anything but, but he has to accept who he is and the greatness of who he is and that's a such a cool look at what Elrond means because when you when you get to the end and you realize that and you go back and read that phase you see that that's what Elrond means it's that he means you need to recognize who you are before you can have my daughter's hand that's the these are the prerequisites we have not that you have to earn it but that you have to accept the responsibility and the greatness that is who you are in order to be worthy of her yeah, and I I know it's not in the book, but I love in Return of the King the movie where the whole scene of of Aragorn kind of still being reluctant to being to take up you know, the mantle of king and and Elrond and Elrond kind of recognizing that Arwen is is not, is fading away as an elf and she's not she's not going to go to Valinor and he says all right well if he's if she's going to stay here he's got to be the king so she the whole scene of him forging reforging. Uh, the sword uh i believe it's the new one is is Anduril and giving it to him and he's become who you were born to be and mm-hmm. right you know, yeah how he should go and to get the king of the dead to follow him um just I, I love that scene and i know it's like i said i know it's not from the books but um i, I like it both i like them both ways so <laughs> but even in the but even in the books they say that we i think we talked about the uh poppy's traveling song of not all who wonder are lost and the whole po- you know, I don't mm-hmm. have the whole poem in front of me, but it's like not all that glitters is gold kind of showing that this guy who's been living as just kind of a, a dude that nobody, everybody kind of dislikes him because he's kind of on the outskirts and he's kind of an outlaw and not even realizing that he's protecting, you know, the Shire and um, you know, this land the whole time with his people. So, and you know, he come to find out he's the King uh, <laughs> or he's, he will be the King. So. Um, but yeah, I love Aragorn. He's probably one of my favorite, uh, as I've said, <laughs> characters. So yeah, there's definitely kind of almost, and I don't know if Tolkien was was thinking of this like consciously, but there's almost kind of the thing of the in Catholicism we have this idea of the mystical marriage between the bridegroom Christ and his bride the Church. So you have that kind of you know Aragorn, you know he. He, he definitely is a Christic kind of figure. You know, he's, he's the returning king. He's very Davidic. And then you have Arwen, who's almost like a representation of the church in that kind of way. And I, I, I know that Tolkien says he, he didn't put a lot of that stuff in consciously, at least in the first drafts. He's, he says something interesting. He's like, he was more conscious in the revision, mm-hmm. he said. So I wonder if in plotting out Aragorn and Arwen's story, if that was in his mind at all. Ah, you can't escape that. That's (laughs) that's the beauty of it, right? Is that it's just, it gets baked into you. (laughs) And it's funny, uh, speaking of of Aragorn, um, it's almost out of like, it's because of Aragorn's relationship with Arwen that we have our next pairing, which is Faramir and Eowyn, because poor Eowyn, she really wants to be with Aragorn. <laughs> I do feel so bad for her because especially if you don't know about the appendix appendices, you see the two of them hanging out a lot and you mm-hmm. think, okay, I see where this is going. And then Eowyn thinks the same thing. And so if you don't know about Arwen, you're like, well, why can't they be together? You know, why does he keep pushing her away? Um, and so it's sad because he's he's that kind of guy that's just so nice and so chivalrous. It's almost like a lad you have everyone just yeah. like accidentally falls in love with him. Like Aragorn cannot stop being nice to her. And I just think that it's a I feel like it's a very relatable scenario that a lot of people go through. And it's it's kind of mm. sad, but it's kind of funny. 
And it's very human. I like that Tolkien kind of threw that in. Yeah. And the, the whole relationship later between Faramir and Eowyn is so human, you know, like it, they, they, it starts out as a friendship, mm-hmm. you know, they they meet in the houses of healing, you know, be, 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 because she wants to get out of the houses of healing. And she's like, well, Faramir's someone in authority. I'll just go to right. him and have him order the doctors to let me go. And he's just like, well, I'm also a patient here, so I'm going to do what the doctors say. You know, <laughs> he's like, how about we hang out instead? Right. Yeah. No, I, I love how he at, at, at first she's she's I don't want to say oblivious. She may be purposefully not paying attention to these signs because he, he gets out his mother's mantle. And gives it to her, this like blue mantle with stars on it. And it Mm. belonged to his mother that he lost in childhood. And I'm like, and and afterwards, she she's still kind of pretending that she doesn't see where this is going. And I'm like, come on, man. (laughs) And I love she doesn't want to get hurt again, man. (laughs) Oh, you know, that's true. Yeah. But I love how Faramir like he just comes out with it. He's like, I know that you wanted to marry Aragorn. But yep. you can't. So how about me? <laughs> 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 like he just comes out with it and she's kind of uh, like, oh, OK, maybe so. <laughs> right. Yeah. It just works out like they're just both very, very honest about it. And I think that's kind of funny, but it's it's also great. Yeah, no, that's great. And I, I like how, you know, you know, he, he he keeps calling her the white lady, the the white lady of Rohan. And he. Again, he's he's so much like Percival or one of the other knights of the round table, you know, Sir Gowan, you know, like he 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 says something like, you know, we will go to Athelion and there we'll make a garden and all things will grow, grow with joy there if the white lady comes. And I'm like, you're laying it on a bit thick, but I think he's it's so working. Cute. I know. <laughs> I think that would work with anybody. Yeah. Well, and she's and she's a hero. I mean, like, that's yes. that's the other thing to remember, you know, is that she's she's the one who slew the witch king. That's mm-hmm. that's a big deal. Yeah. That's the great thing. <laughs> like, it would be crazy. Like, It'd be so much fun. <laughs> and can you imagine the marriage down the road and anytime he's not doing a chore or something? And she's like, well, remember who slew the witch king? Like, she can always hold that over him and. Yeah, I don't think she would. You were unconscious. She's... Like yeah, when what, I was playing the witch. What were you doing that day? You just got was... shot with an arrow. Big whoop. Or whatever. However he got hurt. <laughs> yeah, but I, I like and I think Thomas, you mentioned this before. Their story is all about healing. Mm-hmm. And it's their love for one another. That that they heal one another. Because both of them you know, are coming from all this trauma. They've both been affected by the black breath of the Nazgul. And both of them are hurt both physically and psychologically. And the love that they have for one another is this healing power. And I, I, yeah, that's, I, I I think that's the heart of their story. And that's, I think why I like it so much. And and you feel like they're going to go on and that's going to carry on in their relationship too. Right. Like they're going to go back to these places that were destroyed by the orcs and just by the war itself. And they're going to rebuild them. Mm. And, and that's that's what they're I mean, the two of them, that's what they would do. Right. Like she would say, we have to do something. And he would say, OK, let's do it. <laughs> and, and they'd make it happen. Well, and she even says, like, I don't want to be a warrior anymore. Right. I'm going to be a healer. And it's like she finally understands her own vocation almost like. It, and it's through through him. He helps her along the way. And I like that's just so special. Yes, yeah, so I think um, the one last relationship I had on my list was Sam Gamgee and Rose Cotton, mm-hmm. which is probably my other favorite one. They're great. I just like that. Yeah, it, and- it's the simplicity of returning home after the craziness to someone who really didn't have much of the craziness affect them at all and settling down and that's i I feel like tolkien that that's a story that he knew so well from his experience with the war is right seeing people coming home and you could never express all of the things that happened to you like you could tell the stories but it would never be enough to like really 
impress all of those things on someone. And then at the same time, you really didn't want to. You just wanted to come home and, and you'd, you'd become someone different while you were away. And you finally got the pluck to go and ask the girl to dance. And that was, you know, that's kind of where this relationship is. It's like it's, it's Sam, the, the eaves trimmer, uh, becoming Sam, the, the war hero. I love how it says... Um, I forget what the exact phrase was, but when he's coming home after Frodo leaves and, and it's like the house was warm and he was expected. Yeah. And like, just that sense of belonging that he has. Um, and the way that everything wraps up for Sam is, is so sweet. Yeah. And that's the very last scene of the book. Yeah. Is him coming mm-hmm. home to Rose and their children. And that's just great. <laughs> You know, it, it's it's bittersweet because these are things Frodo didn't get to experience. You yeah. know, be, and he, he says, you know, I had to save the Shire, Sam, but not for me. But you get to be solid and whole. And yeah, and that, that's the other thing. I think Sam's relationship with Rose makes him whole. You know, it and I'm, I'm sure, again, Tolkien was thinking about his own relationship with Edith, probably. Like you said, Thomas, he, he comes back from the war. And all these awful, horrible experiences, but he's able to find that peace in someone else and in family. That's just, yeah, it's just like in in so many ways, the hobbits are the heart of Middle Earth. And Mm -hmm. Sam and Rose just kind of exemplify that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, But I had one last question for you guys before we wrap things up. We've talked a lot about the different romantic love stories today but i think it's important to note that there are that one love is a funny word in english because (laughs) it covers a lot of different concepts that in many other languages like greek there are different words for different kinds of love it's not all eros you know romantic love and a lot of the great love stories in middle earth are not actually romantic love stories there's a lot of great friendships in middle earth so do do you guys have a a favorite friendship in the legendarium i feel like frodo and sam is the obvious answer so i'm trying to think of something (laughs) different i like gimli and legolas the Mm -hmm. gimli and legolas battle brothers uh concept is is really cool because they could very easily just kind of have fallen off or just or just been you know warriors together but they really do develop a very intense bond so much so that you know Gimli goes to confessing to him many things that are kind of outside of the bounds of what a dwarf would be you know telling to an elf and then a lot of the stuff about Galadriel and about his plans for the future and what he's you know what he's aspiring to uh and and his desire to to know what is uh what is next for the elves that's that's a really interesting uh, thing for him to admit to and it's because of that friendship that they develop with each other it's mm. very very deep yeah and then to even tie it back to galadriel is she obtained the well the stories say that she obtained the grace for him to travel to the undying lands um, and mm-hmm. is the only dwarf um, to ever kind of get that so um, just through his love of galadriel is you know as we kind of said of that kind of courtly you know love from afar kind of a thing um, but just his friend getting to kind of go see his bestie uh, <laughs> off to, you know, because obviously, well, we could that could be a whole podcast about the dwarves uh, or about the uh, the undying lands and what that means. But um, I think the common interpretation is that they he did not live forever in Valinor, that he no, yeah. would have would have died right. eventually. Um, but having been able to go there at all is, is just pretty powerful. Um mm-hmm. But I mean, as as far as friendships go, I, it's it's hard for me to not say Merry and Pippin. Um, yes, because uh, <laughs> yeah, so because they're uh, Frodo and Sam are great, of of course. But then they're they're definitely while they're friends, there's still a little bit of a little bit of a master and you know and servant, and not in a bad way. But there's still a little bit of Sam is loves his master so much that he is and. It, not quite as like they're not brothers like Mary and Pippin are brothers if that kind of makes sense at least that's right. kind of the way I'm I think about it but still definitely like very a very loving relationship but I mean there's something about Mary and Pippin just going off and on their crazy adventures and 
um, you know, drink entertaining the the men of Rohan and <laughs> by dancing on tables and things like that. That yep. just um, yeah, and and all just they're just they're all their adventures. I and then they get to they in the, just their French their combined friendship, Merry and Pippins with Aragorn, and kind of they eventually they they're laid to rest beside him um, yeah. after they mm-hmm. after they um because I, I believe Aragorn dies first and then Mary and Pippin are laid are laid to rest by him um just because of that friendship so right i think just uh, yeah they're they're some of my favorites as I, I think we've it's hard to argue with them being favorite characters but um and right. even the even not to shout out another podcast but even the the actors uh Dominic Monaghan and uh Billy Boyd are they have a podcast called The French and Onion yeah. <laughs> so Yeah, I love um, that. It's funny that they're like they're playing friends, they became friends uh in real life. So yeah. just the embodiment of their characters uh led to the, led to friendships. So Yeah, I think the the other one that's really interesting is the the relationship to the animals that several of the characters have. So you have Luthien and Juan and you have uh Bill with Sam, you know, so yeah. Sam's Bill uh, oh, is a yeah. very impressive one too, and and they really care deeply about these animals. Uh, that I mean, I mean, Luthien and Juan is obviously a, a much longer <laughs> progression mm-hmm. than uh, than than uh, Bill, uh, but but Sam really does develop a deep relationship with that uh, with that pony because it's it's very significant to him because he kind of feels like the pack mule <laughs> in this situation, mm-hmm. I think, and so he really right. associates with it very closely uh but there's a lot of really good uh love that way like that that loyalty to uh to some to something that is not a human or not a not a sentient being that still deserves that admiration and care uh that is present in a lot of the lord of the rings as well yeah or like gandalf and shadow facts mm-hmm. hey or yeah gandalf, and, really gandalf cool. and the eagles yeah. and he's very true one that strikes me I don't know if it's my favorite friendship, but I like it because it's different is Bilbo and Thorin because it Mm -hmm. proves that friendships aren't always perfect. And Mm -hmm. sometimes friendships go through some rough times and sometimes you have falling outs, you know, very vicious falling outs. But their their reconciliation at the end of The Hobbit Mm. is one of my favorite scenes from Tolkien you know, bar none, you Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. and it just, you just get this sense over the course of the story, how much Thorin and Bilbo came to care about one another. Right. Yeah. Yeah, There's so, there are so many. I would say one good thing, at least from the the Hobbit movies is the song at the end of the Hobbit. uh, The last one that the last goodbye. Oh yeah. um, There was a while where I was like listening to that on repeat just because I love that song. But that's Billy Boyd, isn't it? It is Billy Boyd. Yeah. 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 There's actually an interesting like you. I think it was like an extra with the with the films, but you can go watch like a a writing of that song and how they only had they didn't have very long to like write it and put it together for the movie. So, Um, but yeah, just that I love how that song, it just kind of embodies Thorin and, and Bilbo's friendship, but also just the whole kind of quest of like, you're going to lose and even just life in general, like you're, you're going to lose friends along the way. Uh, So eventually, you know, everybody will say goodbye at some point, whether, you know, goodbye due to to death or goodbye due to other reasons. So, yeah. So I love that song. (laughs) Okay. So uh, did, did we have any, uh, any final thoughts or did, did we miss anything in this talk about uh, relationships and love stories in middle earth? I think we've covered the the most important ones, the biggest ones. Yeah. There were a lot of terrible romances. Oh, gosh. uh, (laughs) We don't need to get into those. Right. Sauron and himself. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. That's a good one. (laughs) They're very, very, uh, what's the Greek legend? Very uh, uh, Narcissus, right? Right. The Greek guy who's like obsessed with himself. Oh, yeah. That's very much Sauron. Sauron. But yeah, no, it's like that. That's the great thing about, you know, the legendarium is that it's so expansive that, you know, there's always new, you know, character dynamics and stuff to discover as we, you know, go through as, you know, especially for people who are reading the Silmarillion for the first time or diving into the unfinished tales. You know, there's there's always so much more to discover 
Um, but that's it uh, for us for this episode. But we definitely want you guys to let us know what your favorite uh, romance or friendship from the Legendarium is. And uh, you can let us know by uh, contacting us um, on our Facebook page or on Twitter. or sending an email to MiddleEarth at sqpn.com. Or you can visit our channel on the StarQuest Discord server at sqpn.com slash discord. And we'd also like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Lisa S., Joe S., Christopher H., Mark, and Barb G. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give help us to continue to create the secrets of Middle-Earth and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them too at sqpn.com slash give. And we'll be back next time where we will be having a Tolkien Reading Day special. And I believe the theme for Tolkien Reading Day this year is adventure. So until our next adventure, Thomas Sanjurjo, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Middle Earth. It's been great. And Jeff Hecker, thank you also. Thank you, Thomas. And Caitlin Fasista, thank you as well. Thank you. Once again, I'm Thomas Salerno, and thank you for listening to The Secrets of Middle-Earth on StarQuest. Here's another podcast on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy. The Secrets of Movies and TV Shows. Find it wherever fine podcasts are found, or at sqpn.com secrets.